Howdy folks, and unfortunately welcome to part two of the transmission rebuild. I know you guys voted for one long video. That was my intention, but I'm sorry, it just didn't work out. At the time I posted the poll, I had finished rebuilding the transmission, but I hadn't tried to install it. And I ran into some parts issues. And shockingly, it's not easy to get parts for a 1986 Ford Ranger. So they kind of boxed me in. The video in its entirety is, I think about 80 minutes long. And to render that would take my computer about five hours. And then to upload would take probably between 15 and 20 hours with our donkey powered internet. So yeah, I would have missed my normal upload schedule. So I just decided to chop it up into two parts. Here's part two. It's gonna be pretty long, but I think you guys will like it. We're gonna get the transmission back together, put it back in the truck and cross our fingers. It's gonna work. Well, as per usual, just enough time has passed that I've completely forgotten how this transmission goes together. But I think we have all the parts we need, or most of the parts we need. I bought a complete bearing set, a gasket set, and new nuts for the counter shaft and the output shaft. We also have the input shaft and the output shaft seals, and the little roller bearing between the input shaft and the output shaft. All the parts are clean or clean-ish. The gasket surfaces have been prepped. We've got a lot of things to put back together. This is the main case. It had a broken bolt here for the pan. I drilled that out. Otherwise, it's in good shape. The bearing journals are good. It's ready to use. This is a bottom loader transmission, so all the gears and stuff get loaded through this big opening in the bottom. It's the opposite of a top loader, if you hadn't figured that out. So we're gonna start with first gear. It has an inner race and a bearing already installed. Then we need a synchro ring. Next up is the sliding clutch. Followed by another synchro ring. And then second gear. Now we can slide the main shaft through that whole assembly. I've got a mark on it somewhere. Maybe, yeah, there it is. I wanna line that up with my sliding clutch cause it's, the splines are pretty tricky on that thing. There we go. So the big chamfer on the sliding clutch goes towards the rear. If you get this in backwards, you'll end up with a big gap between second gear and the synchro. So you can't really put it together backwards. All right, next up is third gear. Then the synchro ring. And then the inner part of the sliding clutch. This guy here with the grooves on it has to go towards third gear. Like so. Now the outer part of the sliding clutch see it has three spots, one, two, three, here where it's been relieved. Those three spots have to fit over these little spring tabs. There we go. All right, we gotta install a snap ring on the end here. Perfect. Okay, so that's kind of pretty well captured now. Let's see, what's next? All right, the counter shaft next. I've already pressed new bearings on it. All right, 
we've got our new input shaft bearing installed. That was the one that was bad. We'll also put a new roller bearing on the inside and a synchro ring on the outside. Well, this should go together. I don't know what was so hard about getting it apart. Something I was doing wrong there. Yeah, that's the problem. I can't get the freaking counter shaft down in there once I do that. This is a crap design. It really is. Why would they make that that way? Yeah, once the input shaft, well, let's see. Yeah, because you can't pull the main shaft back any further. Well, maybe you can. Oh, hold on. Yeah, it still won't go. Ha! Look at that. Well, there we go. Okay. All right, I've installed the two shift rails for the main main box. We're gonna slip in this shim for the counter shaft and then install the retainer. Should have done that before I installed the shift rails. All right, folks, I decided to call it quits last night. Things were not going well. It turns out that I cannot rebuild the transmission on three hours of sleep. So we're gonna regroup this morning, probably back up a little bit, maybe undo a few things we did yesterday and see if we can get this thing sorted out. I don't like the way this input shaft bearing fits. The snap ring should be flush up against the case. And then we're gonna install this bearing retaining retainer housing along with a shim. And the shim that we need should be, I mean, it should be the same as the old shim. The bearings are gonna be 
you know, within a few tenths of each other, typically. So something is wrong. I think what's wrong is that the See if I can do this without losing the whole thing. I think this bearing is not installed far enough on the main shaft. So we need to peel this reverse gear and retainer back off and yeah, try to fix that. So just to clarify, I think the problem is that this bearing right here, this double angular contact bearing on the output shaft is not pushed in all the way. So it's not squeezing this main shaft gear set together and that's causing problems it's causing the thing to bind up the the synchros are basically locking the thing up all right here's what i'm thinking a couple of these adapters off my tire balancer and then this thing i believe they call it a daisy wheel off my arbor press and we'll slip on the old nut Problem is I've got no way to hold that shaft. That's the idea anyway. Well, That seems to have worked. Good deal. Yeah, we're right up against the case now. Cool. So now we're supposed to measure from the bearing to the case with the depth mic. And it is currently one sixty-eight. So 0 0.168, 168 thousandths. Uh, before the closest I could get it was was 203. So we moved it, we moved it back, what 35 thousandths, a little more than that. Now the depth of our cover with the shim. Is exactly the same so we're good you're supposed to have between zero and four thousandths clearance between this shim and the face of the bearing and then when we put the gasket on there's going to end up being a little bit more of a gap but yeah I believe we're perfect now so that's good that's the thing that that was freaking me out last night I couldn't get that measurement to come out I was just too tired so Cool. We can, I believe we can now install this cover and then we'll set the clearance on the counter shaft. All right, we need to install the thicker of the two spacers in front of the front race. And then I've already installed a new front seal and we got some tack on our gasket. All right, let's see. How did it go? Oh, the studs go out here. The torque spec on these bolts is 22 to 30 foot pounds, 29 to 40 Newton meters. So usually in my mind, when they have that large of a torque range, it means nobody really cares. 
Just tighten them up. But don't tell the comment section that. Okay. The studs, we'll worry about that when we put the bell housing on. So we should have end play in our input shaft approximately equal to the thickness of the gasket. Looks pretty close. I don't know why they want that much end play. You know, 18 thousandths is the thickness of the gasket. That seems like a lot, but that's what they say to do. Usually has something to do with thermal expansion or some other, you know, unseen force. Anyway, we're done on the front. Now we're supposed to stand it up on its nose and work on the back. All right, to set up the counter shaft bearings, we're gonna make sure this race is fully seated and that everything turns freely. Then we're gonna use this shim. This is a selective shim, which means that there's multiple different thicknesses available. Of course, we only have the one that came out of it. But like I said, it's normally, the bearing tolerances are so close that it's normally not a problem to reuse the spacers. So what we're supposed to do is put a straight edge across the top and then try to spin. I guess we're supposed to try to spin the shim underneath the straight edge. And if it rotates freely, we put in the next size thicker shim. But this one actually has essentially zero gap. So that's what it's supposed to have. It's supposed to be between zero and two thousandths. I believe that's two thousandths of preload. So we're right on the money. Which means we can now install the retainers. We're good to go back here. So we'll install these flathead cap screws with a little bit of Loctite because it would be a bad day if one of these backed out. Let's get torqued to 11 to 16 foot pounds, which isn't very much. There's a torque spec for that castle nut on the reverse gear here, but it's kind of irrelevant because we had to line up the hole for the cutter pin. Got that installed to aircraft NASA mill spec. Uh, before I get a ton of comments, I don't like to use brass punches when I'm putting things with bearings back together because brass punches are constantly shedding little pieces of brass and they get wedged everywhere and they make a mess. That, that inner race is way harder than the punch. It won't hurt it at all. Uh, but what will hurt it is that I put that reverse idler on backwards. So let me flip that around. That's better. Now the overdrive synchro. So again, the gap in the teeth 
corresponds to the little key right here. Yeah, that one I think will heat up. So it's got to press a long way. All right, now we're supposed to install this little spacer and then the roller bearing. And then this is the overdrive gear. And the company that I bought these parts from, they said that these transmissions, they kind of have a reputation for the overdrive gear, this really thin surface here, digging into the thrust bearing surface of the synchronizer. And it causes excessive end play. But this one looks like it's in perfect shape, so. Not gonna worry about it. There is an update kit you can buy that has a different, I don't know if it has a different style bearing or something, uh, but the parts were not available when I ordered these. So even if we wanted to do that, we can't, but ours are in good shape, so we should be fine. And then that guy. So that completes our reverse arrangement. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, folks, we got a problem here. You see this? Our aircraft spec cotter pin hits that gear. There we go. See? These pedants in the comment section almost got me in trouble. All right, now we have this tiny little ball. And its purpose is to keep the thrust washer from turning. There we go. And now, a couple of bearings. Like so. I think we'll also heat those up, make them easier to fit on. Wow, what's the problem there? a burr on that one. Cool. I don't know why they have snap ring grooves in them. There's no snap rings. Well, I gained nothing by installing these shift rails. I should have just left them out. All right, these little pins, they get installed in holes that are drilled between the two shift rails, and that's an interlock. So the rail has a little groove like this, and you have to have at least one groove open for the other rail to shift. That way, 
you can't shift more than one rail at the same time. It's just a safety, safety precaution. But they're kind of a, kind of tricky to get installed. I'm gonna have to peel this thing out of here. Oh, see, it's already working. The interlock, I mean. So I'll show you that interlock. So basically, I can't move both of them at the same time. I can only move one. Kind of a cool system. Anyway, tighten that back up. Now these springs are supposed to go with the tapered end towards the ball. All right, the counter shaft nut gets torqued to 120 foot pounds. Come on, baby. Now the big one on the main shaft, I'm not sure what we're gonna do there yet. Well, the torque Nazis are gonna hate me, but we're just gonna go by feel. I don't have any good way to torque that nut. The spec is 185 foot-pounds, I wanna say. That's good enough for me. There we go. Simple. So simple. Uh, except I got that thing on the wrong side. All right, back off. There, simple, nothing to it. So the first and second, third and fourth detents just have bolts that bottom out, but the reverse and fifth gear detent has a set screw and you're supposed to install it to a depth of 0.24 inches. So we're a little too deep right now. Close enough. Now we're supposed to fill that hole up with RTV silicone. So that'll lock it in place and keep it from corroding.
All right, guys. I think we can button it up. It shifts into every gear. Everything turns freely. I think we're good to go. Oh. Well, we use some new bolts. Uh, one of the things people do with these bottom loader transmissions is they'll they'll upgrade to a, a stiffer pan. A lot of times they're made out of a thick aluminum plate and it helps keep the the transmission case from spreading. I have somewhat limited limited experience on manual transmissions in cars, but I remember like on the old 5.0 Mustangs. I think that was a Tremec T5 transmission in those. And when you started putting out a lot of power, the helical gears inside the transmission, because of the angle of the teeth, it would spread the case this way. And that basically limited the amount of power you could put down with one of those cars. All right, folks, we made it. This thing is ready to go back in the truck. That's a pretty handy tow rig. Forklift's feeling jealous. Don't worry. Someday we'll fix it and it can go home. Come on. Come on, pup. Hey, you can do it. Come on. Maxwell. You want to tell everybody why you're scared? Max hates wind. I don't know why, it freaks him out. And that's bad news because it's windy here all the time, isn't it, pup? Yep. So you just get to be super sad all the time. <sighs> all right, folks. I've been toiling away behind the scenes. I think we're finally ready to install this transmission. We did get a transmission jack upgrade. This is a Snap-on TJ100. I picked it up used off of Facebook Marketplace. Well, gently used for, for way too much money. The seller told me that the whole RAM assembly has already been replaced once before because it was leaking. And it's leaking again, so should fit in just fine around here. It's a massive improvement over my Chicom special over here. Although, strangely, this one's never leaked at all. Can't say that much about the lathe. Anyway, on to the truck. I went poking where I shouldn't have gone poking. The exhaust Y-pipe 
was kind of crumbling over here on the right hand side. And I figured there's never going to be a better time to fix that. So I pulled it off. That went about as well as you might imagine. So I was able to get three out of the four bolts out with some help from my friends, oxygen and acetylene. And then the fourth one just broke right off. So I had to drill it out, but I think we can save the threads or I have saved the threads. So this flange clamp over here on the right side is just rotted out. There's nothing left of it. So my thought was I could pull this Y pipe out and it would make it a lot easier to install the transmission because it's almost impossible to get the bell housing past that left side pipe. But of course that opened a whole can of worms. The whole thing's pretty rusty. And the tailpipe actually just fell completely off. It's laying over here. Uh, that's in pretty rough shape. But the good news is the donor truck has a good exhaust. So we're gonna use the Y pipe off the donor truck. Well, we're gonna use pretty much the whole exhaust off the donor truck. It's in a lot better shape. Both clamps are good. It's quite a bit less rusty. Unfortunately, the O2 sensor was broken and I tried to remove the O2 sensor from the old Y pipe and it just took all the threads with it. So we need a new O2 sensor, which it's not easy to find these old three wire sensors. I ordered one, hopefully it'll be here this afternoon. And then the catalytic converter was missing off of the donor truck and somebody, somebody put together this little gem. Uh, I don't know that much about welding, but I know quality work when I see it. That is very special. I'm guessing what they did is they, they chopped the converter off because it was plugged and they tried to scab this together with the Y pipe still installed on the truck. So they were just kind of trying to reach over from the top and weld that blind. Anyway, I formicated this guy here. A little slip over. So that should work a little bit better. All right, we gotta make sure our spacer plate is in place. And no, I'm not going to replace the clutch or the rear main seal. Yes, I know that's wrong and that I should always replace the clutch in the rear main seal. I'm sure you'll tell me about that in the comments. All right, guys, transmission is in, it's bolted up. Got the spacer plate in there. You don't want to forget that. Got the Y pipe back up with some new bolts. That was definitely the way to go. Uh, pulling that Y pipe was very painful, but it makes putting the transmission back in so much easier. I'm not actually sure you're, you're, it's even possible to get the transmission back together with that exhaust in place. It's just too close to the, to the firewall up there. Anyway, we're in the home stretch now. We need the transfer case, both drive shafts, both shifters, the rest of the exhaust. Got to put that O2 sensor in, uh, reinstall the starter, some of the wiring, there's the speedo cable and then we're going to have to bleed the slave cylinder at some point. That's always fun. Yeah, I'll bring you guys back when it's done. Got the transfer case installed. This is where the snap on transmission jack really shines. We don't have to have our sketchy Jenga blocks anymore. 
So it's got these adjustable arms, so they slide in and out, up and down, and they also can be adjusted to three different angles. I've never seen another transmission jack quite like it. I mean, I know you can buy different adapters and you know rear axle adapters, fuel tank adapters, but this thing's actually pretty universal. I like it. I think that's it for the bottom side. Got our new O2 sensor. Transmission's full of oil. Drive shafts are in. The exhaust. It's not pretty, but I think it'll work. So we've got, I don't know how many different joints in this thing. It's almost comical. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That should be enough. Anyway, that's the muffler from the original exhaust system. Pretty much everything else is from the donor truck. So the donor truck had the old cherry bomb. And uh, yeah, I think my glass pack days are over. Plus it doesn't really work. You see how this muffler, the, the inlets in the center and the outlets up at the top, that's important. Otherwise, you get a dip in the tailpipe and that's what caused this to rust out here. So that won't hurt anything, I don't think. Yeah. All right guys, we finally have the parts we need to finish up the Ranger. So this cobbled together abortion takes the place of the old catalytic converter. So on the 86, it just had a single converter up here in the front, but on the 88, it had a dual converter that was kind of built into one unit. And somebody's long since deleted that, but they saved the old flange off both ends. So I was able to buy both converter flange gaskets, but they were not easy to find. I think these things have been on a shelf somewhere since the Reagan administration. Anyway, we'll get that installed and we should be done. Well, folks, the exhaust has a little bit of a rumble that it didn't have before. I wonder if we still have a bit of a leak. But the transmission is dead quiet. So that's good news. Let's see if it'll go in gear. No problem. Good. So we got the slave cylinder bled. There's fourth. Beautiful. Got some noise behind the dash. I bet it's the speedo cable. Yeah, it may take that a while to settle into its happy place. Well, we're doing pretty good. The exhaust is definitely louder. I'm not sure if it's just because of our converter delete or something's a little bit wonky causing a leak. Uh, I'll probably run it for a little bit and then I'll tighten up those bolts. And that speedo cable was pretty annoying. Wasn't expecting that. But the transmission is good. That's awesome. The shift's smooth, no grinding, no clashing. Fantastic. Oh 
boy, can we fit back here? I think we can. Perfect. All right, folks, there you go. Rebuilding a Mitsubishi FM145 transmission. It's doable, but it's not for the faint of heart, I gotta say. Uh, at this point, I've gotten to read the comments from the first video, gotten some pretty good feedback. Most people seem to think that I'm crazy and that I should just toss that transmission and pick up a used one and install it. And I can see why they said that. It's pretty overwhelming trying to figure out how to get that thing back together. Uh, the problem is the cheapest used transmission I could find was $750 and it was three hours away from me. So the book time on rebuilding the transmission is 15 hours, but five of those hours are just removing and installing. So the actual rebuild is only 10 hours and the parts that we bought, which was all the bearings and all the gaskets, that only cost $160. So in my shop, to remove and install the transmission and rebuild it by the book, that would cost about $1,400. To remove and install a used transmission would cost, uh, let's say $1,150. Plus somebody's gotta either drive six hours and get that transmission, or we have to get it shipped in by freight. And freight shipping has gone, just gone crazy. I wouldn't be surprised if it cost us three or $400 to get that shipped here. So really you end up basically, it basically ends up being a wash in my opinion. And I feel better rebuilding the one we have because it's only got 80 something thousand miles on it. It doesn't have any other problems other than that input shaft bearing. You know, we know what we have. When you put a used part from a junkyard in, you know, you pays his money and it takes his chances. So, yeah, I guess the big problem is that uh, $1,400 to rebuild the transmission is, if I'm being honest, not far off from what I was asking for the whole truck. So uh, financially, we're, we're upside down on this thing from the get-go, but we kind of knew that going in. And, you know, sometimes, well, maybe more often than not, I just do things like this because I want to see if I can. It's kind of a fun challenge. And you know, it makes pretty good content for YouTube, I think. I didn't find any other, any other videos about rebuilding one of these transmissions. Of course, it's probably because you know, they haven't made one for 30 years and they're all in the crusher now, but we shouldn't let that stop us. Anyway, thanks guys for watching and yeah, I'll see you next time.